right, welcome back to another Kirby on Sports podcast exclusive, exclusively on the Kirby on Sports podcast YouTube page. Before we move any further, our sponsors, PM Plus Reserves, Shenandoah Primitives, and Dr. Dave Leadership Corporation without our sponsors. The Kirby on Sports podcast would not be where it is today. Honored and pleased to be joined by a man who is well known in the DC sports community. He spent 22 years broadcasting the Washington Wizards. He now runs his own podcast back with his former broadcast partner, Phil Schneer, on the road with Buck and Phil, the legendary Steve Buckhans, who coined the word dagger. Steve Buckhans, find him on Twitter at Steve Buckhans. Steve, Welcome to the Kirby on Sports Podcast. How are you, my friend? Josh, I'm good. I see you all the time on Twitter. Obviously, I follow you, and uh, it's great to be with you on the podcast. Oh, uh, It is an honor and a pleasure once again, and I, uh, we're going to get way back to December 4th, 2015. I'm not sure if you know, um, uh, if you remember that day at all, but I do remember there was a Wizards game, and I think they were playing the Utah Jazz. They had a special thing set up once a year that my school went to called Sports Career Day. And radio voice of the Wizards, Dave Johnson, would speak in front of a whole bunch of marketing students like two hours before the game. And I'm like, man, we get to leave school early and go to a Wizards game? And I'm like, oh, this is classic. And that one year, me and my buddy both got picked to go down and high five the players coming out of the tunnel. And I'm like, my gosh, I'm on the court. This is incredible. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm a big Wizards fan watching TV. I'm like, man, this is how it all happens. I'm seeing everything. Next thing you know, I see a guy in a suit. It, it's the man himself, Steve Buckhans. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. That's Steve Buckhans. <laughs> he he's right there and I see him on my TV. And I mean, just the little excited teenager that I was, I was jumping up and down and saying, Steve, Steve, Steve. And I saw Phil too. And I did the same thing and I have it up here. I'm, I'm going to have to find a way to post this on the video, but I got a terrible quality selfie with both you and Phil on the court the night of December 4th, 2015. Wow, that's pretty cool. I'm glad you remember that. You know, it's funny because I remember certain encounters and meetings to guys that I looked up to when I was little. Heck, I remember, I mean, we, I'm going to go way back, dude, to before you were born. But <laughs> back when I used to, my parents used to take me to Baltimore to see the Bullets play. And that's how far I go back with the team. But I remember standing sort of near the little tunnel where they would run through the little walkway and, and anybody could go down there. They didn't stop you. And I was young. I was, um, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old, maybe 12. And, um, and I stood there and watched as Earl Monroe came out. So that would have been 1967. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I actually got a wristband from him, which I still have to this day. Oh, wow. That's how old that is. But that was, you know, he was my idol growing up. And then in, it was one game where they were playing, I guess it was the, well, I don't know if it was the Philadelphia Warriors or the Lakers, to be truthful, but uh, Will Chamberlain walked out and I thought, my God, that's the biggest human being I've ever seen. So I remember all these encounters just like you do. Yeah. And I'll never forget them. I mean, they're fresh in my mind. Yeah. And it was funny, the very next sports career day, because I went back to back, I got picked to be on center court. So not once, but twice wow. I was on that court. It was incredible. Best moments of my life um, in the world of sports uh, in terms of going to Wizards games, at least. But there's uh, a collection of a whole bunch of them. So, Steve, I mean, I, I want to start going way back. I mean, you started, you grew up in D.C. And um, you started your journey if I'm correct, in Atlanta with WSB TV. So you started there after going to JMU. I want to touch on JMU a little bit later, but that, but your heart was in DC and you ended yeah, up back. Me, in let me stop you, Josh, because 
that I, I've read that um, bio before, and they somehow they had misinformation. But uh -oh. I wish I had started in Atlanta. I <laughs> I started in Harrisonburg, Virginia, a little bit smaller than Atlanta. Oh, so, oh, 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 yeah, I, I started where I went to college at JMU, and so that's where I started in radio and in TV. Oh, I did not see that. Yeah, absolutely. Trust me, I, I went to three stations before I got to Atlanta. So I was in a, uh, in Harrisonburg, uh, and that was a small market that was about the 196th market in the country out of about 210 at the time. Worked there in radio and TV, went from there to Chattanooga, Tennessee, which was the 71st oh. market in the country. Did sports there at, at the NBC affiliate. Went, I was there a year and a half. Then I went to Nashville, Tennessee, did sports there for just 10 months at the CBS affiliate. And then I went to Atlanta to WSB TV. And I was there for three years working with people like Ernie Johnson and some other folks that have gone on to have great careers. And then I came up to DC in 1984. So five stations total, but yeah, three before I even got to Atlanta. So yeah, you, got, you can't jump from Harrisonburg to Atlanta. Maybe today you can, but back then you had to go small and climb that ladder. Yeah, but I, I mean, going back to JMU, I mean, in our south of where I live, I love it down there in Harrisonburg. I, I mean, the school has turned into a big name for broadcasters, wouldn't yep. you say? Absolutely, broadcasters and athletes. So when I went to school there, Josh, there was 7,500 kids. Now there's 22,000. Oh, yeah. And when I was there, it was the perfect time to be in communications because the radio station was tiny. Uh, it was 10 watts of power. You could yell further than the signal. And then the station uh, got a huge grant from the state. The school did, uh, got a $50,000 $100, grant, and they built a brand new radio station, 50,000 watts, full stereo. It was great. And I was doing stuff, and I was coming up here even back then to cover the bullets. And, um, and it was really cool. And I would get these great interviews with not only Bullets players, but people like Dr. J and other stuff like that, and bring them back to this tiny little Harrisonburg and put them on the radio. And people were like, damn, where'd you get that stuff? <laughs> I went up to DC to get the, to cover, you know, I get press pass. So um, it, it was, and then, you know, like you said, we've turned out, you know, um, Lindsay Zarniak, who's obviously very, very well known, Lindsay Murphy, another Lindsay who, uh, worked at Channel 5 with Dave Feldman. Um, um, the fellow from CNN, uh, Bob uh, Acosta, uh, Jim Acosta, uh, he, he very well-known CNN national reporter. Uh, Jim Acosta went to James Madison. And then obviously, you know, your athletes. We, I mean, we had 13 guys in the NFL this year. Oh, yeah. Orland, who played for the Washington football team. But we had, obviously, the big names were Gary Clark, who played at Madison and played for the Skins. And then you had Charles Haley, uh, who's, uh, you know, after, after uh, Tom Brady, he's got more Super Bowl rings than anybody in history. And we also had uh, Scott Norwood, who obviously was the kicker for the Buffalo Bills, and many other uh, excellent athletes. Baseball, Billy Sample was a great player at Madison who went on to the majors, soccer, uh, obviously football. I mean, we've had some great athletes come out of there and they still continue to come out of there. So it's not a little teeny school anymore. It's now it's a, uh, it's pretty well known at this point. All you have to do is ask some of the folks down in Blacksburg after Madison upset Virginia tech one year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is true. I do remember that, but I mean, down there now, beautiful area. I mean, it's, one of the well-known campuses and you look at the main strip there i don't remember what the name is but overlooking the mountains what a better place to go yeah if you're looking for um uh, rural and not urban uh then yes that's where you want to be um now uh it is gorgeous so the 81 is the interstate that goes right really through through there's two campuses now back in the day there only used to be the side on the west of 81 which was all of campus and the, the arena and Godwin Hall and now you, the football stadiums there. But now to the east side of 81 is a whole nother campus to accommodate these 22,000 kids. But that football stadium they have there, of course, their football team is outstanding. It's, you know, for FCS, oh, yeah. it's one of the top two or three in the country. And the stadium is gorgeous. I mean, it's, it's, there, there are a lot of, uh, you know, major college teams that stadiums aren't as nice as that. So uh, it's grown 
enormously, as you mentioned, and it is beautiful. And if you if you love the mountains, and I mean, how great is it the fact that it's an hour and fifty minutes from from DC, and you're in the mountains, and it's gorgeous, and oh yeah, call it God's country down there. It's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. So I I'm gonna ask you one thing, because my favorite restaurant is in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Really? When you were there, was there a cookout established there yet? That's the name of it, cookout. Yeah, cookout. Oh, oh no, there wasn't. No, there and wasn't. Trust me, Josh. This is going back a few years, but we didn't. There weren't a lot of restaurants there. Like if you didn't eat at the D Hall, your choices were Pizza Hut, McDonald's. There was a place called Ciro's Pizza. Um, there were very few. I mean, the, maybe a Golden Corral or something like that. There, there, there really weren't many. And uh, now, of course, like you say, there's everything. So yeah. I have to check that place out because I'm going to be doing some football games down there. So I'm going to check out that place. I, I definitely recommend Cookout when you're doing football games. So yeah, yeah, moving on, um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I did sort of mess up the bio there about where you have okay. been after. Somebody wrote that, and I don't know where they got the information, <laughs> and I've never bothered to correct it. But, yeah, that I, I've seen that before. It said – started in Atlanta. It's like, dude, man, I wish I started in Atlanta. I had to go small before I got to Atlanta. So um, what is that like for you after coming out of JMU and going to all these small affiliates to finally make it to Atlanta and then from Atlanta coming back to Washington to be at what, what is now Fox 5? Yeah. You know, it's, it's really something, Josh, because um, – you know, back then when I first started, first of all, I started in radio. So I wasn't even thinking about TV. I was a mm -hmm. freshman in college and I just wanted to get some experience and maybe get on the air. And I did. And luckily it was at a very small place where you could do that. They would take people with no experience and put them on the radio because, you know, hardly anybody was, could get the signal. You know, you, you could make all kinds of mistakes and not, you know, get fired for it. And then I transitioned from radio and I did four years of Madison, what was Madison College becomes James Madison University, their basketball. I did the color on the broadcast, on the radio broadcast for four years, and I did women's games as well. So that gave me really my initial training at play by play. But then I transitioned from uh, radio while I was still in college as an intern at the local TV station, WHSV, which is or was an ABC affiliate. I don't know if it still is. They still and, are. Uh, the only TV station in Harrisonburg. And, and, and I was an intern there. While, you know, so I was still going to college and they put me on the air. They put me on to do, um, I was a news and sports reporter uh, during the week. And I anchored the 11 o'clock sports and the weather. They had me do the weather because I've got my pilot's license and allegedly I know a little something about the weather so I could fake it really well. And I faked it real well at 11 o'clock. I don't think many people were watching. And, um, and that's how I really got started. And then, like you say, to go from there to, and again, I wasn't thinking about Washington at that point. I knew someday I'd love to get back here, but that wasn't in my plans. You know, my, my next step was just to get to a, a bigger TV station you know, a town that had like sort of, you know, a real city in it. And so the next step for me was Chattanooga. And while that wasn't a, wasn't a gigantic city, it was a well-known city. People had heard of that before. So I got there and I covered UT Chattanooga and some of the other, you know, minor league baseball. And then I was fortunate enough to go from there to Nashville. And that changed everything because Nashville was a big market, 30th in the country, state capital, uh, while they didn't have pro sports back then, it still was a great TV station. At my TV station, they used to film a couple of shows that you may not have heard of, but back then they were big. One was called Candid Camera and one was called Hee Haw. And they filmed them right there at my TV station. So I could be walking down the hall and I'd see Johnny Cash or Dolly Parton walking oh the other way. Oh my gosh. And I freaked out. I couldn't believe I was 25 years old. Wow. So uh, but that was before Nashville had any pro sports. There weren't, there was no football team. There was no hockey team. There was none of that. There it was Vanderbilt and Tennessee state and middle Tennessee state and a little bit of stock car racing. And that was it. And then the big move after that was to go from Nashville to Atlanta. So I made the, the normal, the natural progression in the South to go from Harrisonburg, Chattanooga, Nashville, Atlanta, 
which was a big TV station, WSB, the biggest station in all of the South and a great station and a great market. Turner was just starting with CNN. Uh, we had obviously the Braves and the Falcons. The hockey team had just left to go to, um, I think, Calgary or wherever, they, the Flames. And then uh, obviously, uh, you know, we had, you know, the other three major sports and you had Georgia Tech and you had Georgia. And when I was there, Herschel Walker was at Georgia mm -hmm. and Dominic Wilkins was at Georgia. So we had plenty to cover. Great TV station was there for three years. And then my biggest break was moving up to Washington in Channel 5 in 1984. So the Washington gig uh, at WTTG, I want to spend some time on that because you ended up bil building yourself all the way up to sports director, correct? Yeah. Uh, when I was hired, it was to do weekends. Mm -hmm. The weekday guy was a guy named Bernie Smilovitz, who um, has been in Detroit for 30 years and had, has made a fabulous career for himself. We're very close friends. Um, and he did this weekdays. And he had interned under Glenn Brenner, the, the late Glenn Brenner, who was a magical sportscaster at Channel 9 here. So Bernie was the weekday guy, and they hired me to do weekends. And then Bernie left to go to Detroit, and they didn't put me in the main job right away. They hired a guy named Joe Fowler, who came in for a year. He didn't have a lot of success. He's very successful now doing infomercials. But back then, he, he wasn't, um, didn't make it as a sports guy. The tough market, he was battling Glenn Brenner and George Michael. So he left, and that's when they put me in that job in like 1987. Wow. And, uh, and so I had the uh, sports director job for the rest of the time I was there until 1997. So I battled Glenn Brenner and George Michael and Frank Herzog at Channel 7. And, uh, I, but we were also, this was before Channel 5 was Fox. We were owned by a man named John Kluge who lived in Charlottesville, one of the richest men in the country. He owned six TV stations, one of them being... Channel 5 in Washington. He owned one in New York. He owned one in LA, San Francisco, big, huge markets. And they were called Metro Media TV stations. And he sold those six TV stations to Rupert Murdoch, who owned Fox. Oh. And those six TV stations became the Fox Television Network. That's how Fox started. And that was in 1987, 88. And so we went from being just the little Channel 5 who actually we had the preseason telecasts of the Washington football team. We went from being the sort of the preseason station overnight to being the Redskins station. We now, now Fox, because Fox, and it didn't happen in 88, it actually happened in 94, but in 94, Fox wrestled away the, the NFC broadcasts from CBS. They outbid them. And now Fox overnight, became the NFC network. And here in Washington, that meant we became the Redskins station. And so, you know, that was it for CBS. They didn't have football for a while, but Fox now had the NFC and they continue to have it, obviously. And overnight, we became the Redskins station. I, uh, I was sent to LA to, to audition and I ended up doing three NFL on Fox games, which were fabulous. In fact, the very first game I did was the Redskins at Tampa Bay. And this was in 94. And then I did two more games, but I, I wasn't able to, they wouldn't let me away from the TV station to do regular broadcasting for Fox. I wish they had, because that might've changed my career course. But at any rate, I did that. Uh, we had Big East basketball at Channel 5. So I did a lot of Georgetown games. And then that eventually uh, you know, manifested itself into doing the Wizards. So being in such a competitive market like that, what was your motivation to continue to keep grinding and perfect your craft, so to speak? Because I, I know in this industry, it's ever changing, especially now. So what was it like for you keeping up the pace and just it, everything that comes with the territory? Well, you know, listen, I think that, um, if you made it that far, for me, that was my fifth TV station. And my goal was always to get, you know, once I got to Atlanta, then my next goal was to get back home, to get to Washington. And, uh, and, and knowing that this market has had tremendous talent with newscasters and sportscasters, Warner Wolf, who started everything that we see today, the likes of Glenn Brenner and George Michael and Frank Herzog and, 
and and I could name a bunch of other sports guys that were tremendous here. Obviously, Mike Patrick, who went on to do a lot of great play by play and many, many others. Uh, when you get thrust into that position, listen, your competitive juices are flowing. You know, it, it didn't take anybody to light a fire under you. If you didn't have that fire, you weren't going to make it. And being in the market with guys like Glenn and George and Frank and so many others, weekend guys like Ken Meese and, and Wally Bruckner and, you know, just so many other great weekend dudes, uh, you had to keep up, man, you know, but, but you were driven to do that. I mean, anybody that's in this business is going to be driven to, to do that. You want to do the best job you can. If you can somehow scoop the other guys with some breaking story, then that's, that's a bonus. Uh, but in the meantime, you just, you know, you did the best show you could do each night. Our show was a little different because we only had one newscast from 10 to 11, the 10 o'clock news on Fox 5. That's all we had. We didn't have an early show. We didn't have anything after that. So we didn't have to compete with the other guys at six o'clock. And we really didn't have to compete with them at 11 because they came on at 11 and we came on from 10 to 11. Now, because we were on for an hour, I would get a little more time than the other guys because they were only on for 30 minutes. And 22 of that was the show and the rest was commercials. So they might get three or four minutes. I might get five or six minutes or seven to do a show, depending on who my news director was and who really liked me. And uh, so your juices are flowing. I'm watching the other guys at six. I see what they have on. You know, if we didn't have what they have, I'd talk to my producers and say, hey, man, did we, did we miss something? How come we weren't at that press conference? But hopefully you were on top of things and, and you just, you know, you were driven to be competitive. And so it didn't take anybody to, to prod me. I, I, you know, you get there, you, you, you got to do the job and you do it every day. Absolutely. Once again, here on a Kirby on Sports podcast exclusive with Steve Buckhans. Find him on Twitter at Steve Buckhans. So I want to go into um, your transition from WTTG to the Wizards, because I know it was sort of pick one or the other, if yeah. I remember correctly. Can you go yeah. into more detail about how that came about and what was the ultimate deciding factor of you going to call Wizards games for the next 22 years. Yeah, it, it, it did come down, Josh, to picking one or the other. Uh, but the way that whole thing came about was I would fill in for a, on occasion for Mel Proctor, who was one of the great play-by-play -play guys ever. He did the Bullets. He did the Orioles. He, was, he did boxing. He did a great broadcaster and a great guy. Um, and sometimes when he would go away to do boxing or something else, uh, they'd call me to fill in knowing I had play-by-play -play experience. And I had a good relationship with Abe Poland, obviously, who owned the team, and Susan O'Malley, who was the president. And they would have me fill in for him on occasion. And then when Mel left the area uh, to go do San Diego Padres baseball, he left in 1996 with about 20 games left in the bullet season. So they had me and Dave Johnson fill out the rest of the season on TV. And Dave's obviously great and a good friend of mine. And um, now at this point, I so and I ended up doing the the uh, well at least the first game of the three game playoff series against Chicago when Michael Jordan played with the Bulls and Scottie Pippen and we had Jawan Howard and Chris Weber that was in '96 and they swept the the, the Bullets but uh, they we had a pretty good team at any rate I did those games were a couple of those games with Phil Chenier and. And I knew that they were going to be looking for a play-by-play -play guy because Mel wasn't coming back. So I went to Susan O'Malley and I said, listen, I, 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 want, I want this job. I want to do these games. And she said to me, well, you know, if you're doing the sports at Channel 5, we can't have you coming to me and saying, uh, I can't be here in November because it sweeps. It's, it's a huge rating period and the TV station won't let me leave the station. Or I, you can't come to me in May if we're in the playoffs and say, uh, I can't do the game because the TV station won't let me out. I said, listen, I, I'm not under contract at Channel 5 right now. At that time, I was working without a contract. And I said, I'm prepared to leave the station and make that switch and make that jump and go Wizards or Bullets full time. They weren't the Wizards yet. And, uh, and I just let her know that. And then I went to the TV station and I said, listen, um, I want to do the play-by-play -play for the Bullets next year but I want to stay here too and do both, which I think I can do. And at the time TV stations didn't, 
They didn't see the forest for the trees. They didn't realize that that could be a really good thing, that their sports director was now going to be the TV play-by-play -play voice of the new Wizards, because we knew at that point that they were going to change their name. In the new arena, they were going from Capitol Center to MCI Center. And oh, by the way, in three years with the greatest player of all time to play for that team, which we didn't know that yet, but you see how things work out. So they didn't want me to do that. So that's when I said to them, okay, well, I'm going to go do the, the bullets. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to do the bullets. They didn't want me to do both. They hired someone else to do, uh, to do the sports locally. And so that's how that happened, Josh. And the next year is when I started in 97 uh, with Phil. So I did it with him for 20 years and then two years with Carol Lawson. But uh, it was the best, you know, it, it, in a number of good moves that I've been fortunate to make in my career, that was, that was the best one at the time because I had done 20 years of anchoring at five different TV stations. Very happy to be there. I was at Channel 5 for almost 14 years. Covered the glory years of the Washington football team with the Hogs and Joe Gibbs and the Super Bowls and got to know all those guys. And it was a great time to be there. It was when local sports really mattered. They don't matter as much now, but they mattered then. So I was fortunate to do all that, but I was ready to then make the move to what I really wanted to do. I'll tell you what, Josh, if you asked 100 sports people, 100 sportscasters, what they'd really like to do. 99 of them will tell you play by play. You can't have more fun than that. You're at the game. And if you get to the level that I got to with the NBA or the NFL or whatever it happens to be, but even college, you're at the game, you're calling the game, you're on the floor with these great players. You almost have to pinch yourself to, to, to know that this is a dream job. And I got to do that job for 22 years. That is absolutely incredible how that started for you. It's r a remarkable story so far. So continuing with this story, you spent, as you said, 20 years with Phil Chenier. Uh, first off, I know it's a very funny story on how you and Phil Chenier met. I'd like for you to tell us that. And the next part to this question will be um, – when you and Phil first started for as long of a period as you all have gone covering Wizards games, what was it like developing that relationship to continue to do better on air? Because I know you have to sort of like gain some sort of chemistry in the broadcast yep. booth in order for the broadcast to be a nice, smooth broadcast. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. And that chemistry doesn't come right away, but I did get to work, you know, like I said, some games before I was full time with him. So uh, and he's listen, he's the easiest guy in the world to work with. So that really wasn't a problem. But the fact that we ended up with great chemistry, I think, uh, you know, is more of a testament to him because he's so easy to work with. But we did we did get along really well. But, um, you know, when Phil is five years older than me. So when I was down in college at James Madison. Um, I'm watching Phil with the bullets in the NBA and he, he then became my second favorite player of all time after Earl Monroe. Phil Chenier was now like, uh, I love this guy. You know, this, this guy is so good. His jumper is so sweet. And, and I really fell in love with him as a player. Hadn't got to meet him yet. Well, I used to referee in, uh, basketball. I refereed in Harrisonburg with a guy named George Tolliver who ended up being well, first of all, he's Christy Tolliver's father, but he ended up being an NBA referee for many, many years. And we refereed in a league called the Shenandoah Valley Officials Association, where we did high school games. And then obviously he went on to do college in the NBA. I got into broadcasting and that's when my referee career ended. But at any rate, um, you know, I'm down there and uh, I'm watching Phil. And then I come home and I'm refereeing in this summer league here called the Urban Coalition League, which was a great summer league you know around the country they have these different summer leagues in philadelphia they have one called the baker league which was big time all the pros would play in it but we had one here called the urban coalition league and all the bull a lot of the bullets would play in it a lot of the university of maryland stars would play in it i remember john thompson would come down to you know um roosevelt high school where we played these games in the summer in 110 degree heat and he'd be there every night watching these games because he wanted to see these players. So at any rate, I'm refereeing there with 
guys like Glenn Harris and his brother, Ronnie and Lou Grillo, who went on to be an NBA referee and a very good friend of mine, Joe Forte. We all refereed in this urban coalition league. And here I am, this guy, I'm, I don't know, I'm 18, 19, 20 years old and I'm refereeing in this league. And now the Bullets have a team in the league. Phil Chenier played on it, Kevin Grevy, Joe Pace, Kevin Porter, uh, a lot of these, Truck Robinson, some great Bullets played on this team and they would have these fantastic games. So there I am in this tiny gym, Roosevelt High School, where my father actually went to high school, believe it or not. And Red Auerbach was his gym teacher. That's another story. Anyway, I'm, I'm refereeing and, and I'm refereeing this game between the Bullets and the University of Maryland, their ex-players. And Phil commits a foul and I call a foul on him. And he turns around and looks at me and he calls me a stupid MF. Okay, <laughs> just like that. Now I got a dilemma now, Josh, because here's my idol Here's a guy I'm looking up to who's now, you know, berated me and called me a stupid MF. And I'm thinking, I'm going to let this go because how, how can I do anything? And then he turns around, he looks at me and he says, he calls it to me again, stupid MF. I had to whack him with a technical foul. <laughs> well, I mean, can you imagine here? Here's like the guy that I look up to. I got to hit him with a technical foul. He was not happy. That's the first encounter I ever had with Phil wow. Shanier. Who it's would, crazy. Who would guess that 20 some years later, we end up being partners for 20 years. But uh, I remind him of that story. I don't even need to remind him. He knows the story so well and he denies it, but it happened. And uh, we went on to be great partners and have, I think, really good chemistry and just really enjoy each other. If you don't like the person you work with and we work very closely together six months a year for 20 years, if you don't really like somebody, you're not going to last 20 years. It's just not going to work. Well, so you just threw the T. You didn't have to throw him out of the um, building? I wasn't throwing him out of the building. Absolutely not. <laughs> how many T's he got. And in the summer league, I don't think anybody got thrown out. The scores of those games were 187 to 186. <laughs> Nobody played defense. Uh, you just did what you did. But oh my God. I, had, I had Lenny Elmore chase me around the gym once because I called a foul on him when he fouled truck Robinson. I mean, it was like a circus down there, you know, but it was great experience for me. The guys like playing in it. And like I said, we had referees that went on to be have great NBA careers, Louis Grillo and Joe Forte. These guys are big time. So the urban coalition league was <clears throat> really fabulous back then. Well, I, I'm telling you, that is the most funniest story on how you met <laughs> Phil. That's incredible. And that 20 years, in broadcasting it together, that's just incredible, in my opinion. So, after your Wizards days, um, an opportunity came about maybe two years ago. I'm not sure, but you started a podcast with Phil on the road with Buck and Phil. And, um, like I've heard you mention on other podcasts and stuff, with the amount of people you know and who Phil know. It's great to see you all back talking about sports and getting all these great guests on, like Ernie Johnson, um, Gus Johnson, for crying out loud, one of my favorite play-by-play -play guys, the most unique, so on and so forth. So what what is that like after leaving um, the Wizards to come back and reunite with Phil, in a way, doing this podcast yourself? Well, you know, we we were out of it for a little while uh, and still obviously very good friends. And we still go to dinner together and vacation and that kind of stuff. And we kind of kicked the idea around because we saw a lot of people doing podcasts and whatever. And we said, look, um, maybe we should think about doing this. What it will do for us is really, first of all, it will reunite us and give us a chance really to just have a voice no matter how many people were listening, we really didn't care to tell you the truth. It would just give us a chance to have a voice and put it out there and say what we thought. Plus we, you know, there was a lot of reaction, obviously, Josh, when I left and when Phil left and um, you could see it on Twitter and people wanted us back and they still do. And, and uh, so we, we said, you know, look, this will be a nice way for us to get back together partnership again. Uh, and if the fans that really wanted to hear us or still want to hear from us about talk about basketball and whatever, if they're still around, 
then maybe they'll listen to the, to the podcast and that's fine with us. And then we also said, listen, this gives us a chance to have a forum, to have, you know, a voice, but also the contacts that we've made over the courses of our careers. Phil is a tremendous athlete and then obviously a broadcaster for the Wizards for 33 years. And then me and my career, I said, you know what, we could have some terrific guests that, that are just not your average guests, but people that are impactful, people that have something to say, people that you sit up and listen to. And I said, between the two of us, we can get some really good people. So that's why we started it. And that's why we continue to do it. We do it once a week, which is a little bit of a disadvantage because sometimes you miss some of the big stories. They happen one day and you can't talk about them until four or five days later. But that's okay. We, we do it. Most of our shows are sort of evergreen, which means they last for a long time. But you're right. Our guests, you know, we started the podcast, our first guest, and we started it right when uh, uh, ESPN, I guess it was ESPN, was doing the last dance, the Michael Jordan special. Okay. So we tried to get MJ, but he was a little busy. So the next best thing, we got his agent, David Falk, who's local and was his agent for 16 years a brilliant man who knows more about Michael Jordan than any person on earth. And he was with us in the, he talked for so long, we had to cut him up into two episodes to start, which we did. And he, and, and I would urge your listeners to go back and listen to that because he tells us stories that we, I didn't even know about Michael Jordan and how he got with Nike and how they had to convince him to go out to Oregon to interview with Mikey uh, with Nike because he didn't want to go. And all of those things, and, and David had to go to Michael's mother to convince her and all of that stuff, all kinds of stories. And like you said, you know, we've had some, our guests, you know, we had Mark Cuban on, who was tremendous. We had Ernie Johnson, as you, meant, as you mentioned, Gus Johnson, Scott Van Pelt. Gus and Scott Van Pelt were both my interns at Channel 5. No, my. <laughs> separate times. So Scott, that's where Scott got his, if you want to call it start, he, I mean, he wasn't on the air. He was charting uh, games for me. And then he went down to the golf channel and that's where he got his start. And Gus Johnson was my intern and then he went away and then he came back to do weekend sports for me. So those guys are very close friends of mine and have gone on to have tremendous careers, but we've had, you know, other guests as well, old players, Earl Monroe and Sam Jones, you know, new players. We had Bradley Beal on, we had Ron Rivera, uh, who was fabulous. Christine Brennan, Natasha Cloud, Lindsay Zarniak. We had Will Bond and we had uh, uh, Gary Williams and Mark Turgeon and the sports junkies. And, uh, you know, you could go on and on and on our guests who I think were really entertaining and very impactful. So it's turned out to be fun for us. It gives us something to do once a week. And, you know, we're happy with it. I don't know how many, I don't really check to see how many listeners we have, but if, uh, if somebody wants to listen to what we have to say, then we're here to, to say it, at least for now. So I'm sure with this podcast, you're sort of talking about current events in sports along with getting guests on and stuff. So I would like to get your thoughts. The Wizards, they had an 0.5% chance of making it to the playoffs. They get Russell Westbrook. They end up making the playoffs. And yeah, you know how that unfolded, unfortunately, losing in the first round after the play in tournament. But moving on to this offseason, it's looking promising so far with Wes Unseld Jr., Wes Unseld son, the story of Wes Unseld. I mean, everybody should know that story about Wes Unseld of Washington. And the Wizards trading Westbrook away for a boatload from the Lakers, which is huge. So things are trending in the right direction for the Washington Wizards. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. I agree with you. And listen, I, I'm the first guy, and I know you've heard our podcast. I, I like Russell Westbrook. I thought John Wall was a really good player, but I think Russell Westbrook's a better player, and he's going to go to the Hall of Fame. Um, now, uh, having said that, you know, he, he did what he did here, which was, I thought, really good. Uh, not just what he did on the court, but but with these players off the court, you know. Now, a lot of them won't be back because there's a bunch of new players on the team. But he's left a mark here in Washington in just one year. And and I think he's a remarkable player, and I loved his game. And I loved the backcourt with him and Bradley Beal. That was pretty special. Uh, but to get what they got for him, like you said, 
is tremendous. So Tommy Shepard is piecing together guys and hoping that, you know, chemistry doesn't happen overnight. So the, the two things you have to be uh, sort of thinking about with regard to this new look team that we have now uh, is twofold. One is chemistry, which hopefully will happen. And I think it will, but it takes a while, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And the other is a constant, which has never been uh, outside of the box for this team. It's always been front and center and that's playing defense. Okay. They could have all these guys in, in the world that they picked up unless they commit to playing defense on a, on a consistent basis, maybe not for 82 games a year, but for the majority of the season, then they're not going to be good. Uh, you look at any good team, they ratchet things up on defense and that's how they, that's how they win games. So we picked up this kid, Daniel Gafford, who I think is really good. And he's a good defensive player. He gives him a rim protector. Obviously Rui, I think is going to be a star. I really do. And then all these guys, like you say, that they got from, from the Lakers and some, and, you know, and the, and the draft pick, you know, from Gonzaga, you know, I think, yes, it's promising. It gives you the opportunity for new excitement to, to get excited for a, hopefully a legitimate reason. Same thing with the football team, you know, and we do it every year. You know, the, we do it. Listen, I covered the Red, the Redskins, the football team when they were really good. And then for 20 years, they weren't really good. <laughs> and every year we would say, oh, but they got this guy or they got RG3 or they got this guy. And, you know, I think they're going to be mm -hmm. and then they crap the bed and they wouldn't be good or whatever. All right. So now we look at them and say, well, their defense is really should be pretty good. And maybe this quarterback can be maybe he's all we need. And, you know, we're people and we got a new coach and we, you know, so, and so you're going to get excited like you do every year for them. And you're going to get excited for the wizards now because they have a whole new team basically. And Bradley Beal still here. And again, you just hope that the chemistry is there and they commit to playing defense for Wes on I know him pretty well. Uh, he's a no nonsense guy. He's a straight and arrow by the book. And uh, he preaches defense too, obviously. And he's got some good experience as an assistant. And I'm very excited for him as a head coach. So I'm looking forward to the season as well. But yeah, yeah, we got a bunch of new guys and give them some time because it's going to take some time. But we've got some really good players, I think, on this team. So I, I got to ask you that uh, this over the course of this past season, the excitement, the amount of triple doubles that Westbrook had, do, do you ever find yourself sitting in your chair watching a game and all of a sudden dagger or score the field goal? You're going to the line pop up by chance, just randomly. Does that ever happen? Yeah, it happens all the time, Josh, except I'm the only one that hears it. It's sort of like a tree falling in the woods. <laughs> you know, if nobody's there. Did it really happen? So um, I'm the only one sitting there watching the game, unless I happen to be with Phil somewhere at a bar watching. Uh, but yeah, when, when, when a play happened. And then the other thing, too, is the amount of announcers that use it. I mean, you hear it all the time. It, it's not in the same context that I used it. I used it only when the Wizards won, and it was a dramatic game-ending dagger. That's the meaning. That's why I, you know, developed that word. Yeah. Trademarked, by the way. Uh, but you, so you hear all these other announcers, you know, even during the, in the middle of a game, they'll say, well, that could end up being the dagger or whatever. And that's fine. I'm, I'm happy that they're all using it. But, uh, but it's, you know, I, I know the way I called it. And I, yeah, I'll be sitting on my couch sometimes and, um, and, and a shot is made at the end and I'm, I scream dagger. Maybe I'll tweet it out once in a while and uh, see what the reaction is. So, yeah, I still miss those calls. And, um, uh, they, you know, they were part of my uh, vernacular for quite a while. You, you'll be happy to know that to this day, I still wear the dagger shirt you sent me uh, we, a few years we, ago. Good. Good. I love you know, it. Hopefully it'll hold up, you know, and uh, there's been a, several different versions. You can still get one. Uh, by going to breakingtea.com, which is, you know, the company where they, they, they ma manufacture these shirts like the day after something major happens, which is pretty cool. But my, the dagger t-shirt we did with them is really neat because it's got a cool picture of a, of a ball going through a net and then my signature and the word dagger and it's kind of cool looking. So I think that's still available. 
uh, if you go to breakingtea.com. Oh, yeah. So a lot of great stories, a lot of great memories here with Steve Buckhands. Find him on Twitter at Steve Buckhands. Steve, before we let you go officially, tell the listeners, the watchers of this exclusive where they can find Buck and Phil on the road with Buck and Phil. Well, you know, I'm not exactly technologically savvy, and I know you can get it on Spotify and Apple and all of that stuff. The easiest way I tell people to do it, because there's a lot of folks like me that don't have Spotify or Apple and don't know how to get it. If you just Google, and I know everybody knows what Google is, if you <laughs> Google on the road with Buck and Phil, you'll get it. It'll come right up. You can click it on. And then I th- want to say we've done 56 episodes you can pick any one of those episodes. That's the great thing about a podcast. It's not radio. It's there forever. And so Google Amen. on the road with Buck and Phil, find whatever, listen to, listen, we had our favorite episodes. All of them I thought were, were really good. I, lo- I happen to really like the Mark Cuban one. The David Falk one was great. Both the Van Pelt and the Gus Johnson ones were good because they're local, especially Lindsay Zarney actually has some great George Michael stories. And, and then so many other great players. The Sports Junkies was a lot of fun. We had Joe B and Craig Lachlan on, and that was a lot of fun. So you can pick any one that you think you might be interested in, and it's a lot of fun. And that's the best way to find it, Josh. I, I don't know any other way to tell you. Just Google On the Road with Buck and Phil, and it'll come up. So, ladies and gentlemen, you need to check out Steve Buck Hanson, Phil Chenier on On the Road with Buck and Phil. I urge you to do it because they do great work. For our sponsors, PM Plus Reserves, Shenandoah Primitives, and Dr. Dave Leadership Corporation, this has been another production of the Kirby on Sports podcast and a Kirby on Sports podcast exclusive, exclusively on the Kirby on Sports podcast YouTube page. Steve, once again, we greatly appreciate the time. I'm honored and privileged to have the opportunity to get you on, and hopefully we can do this again very soon. Thanks, Josh. It was great being with you. I appreciate it. Good questions.